the image you see on your first screen is the wellness garden. I designed it at Rotary Gardens uh, that was installed in 2018. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the features you'll see here. And I think it's important if you walk away with anything, um, you're going to see a wide range of gardens. We'll talk about sensory engagement. There's a lot of neat little tips we'll discuss. You'll see some fun plants, but do know when you're seeing larger gardens like this, the, the intent and the merit and the importance of a garden this size can be extrapolated to our home gardens because I find that my own little literally eighth of an acre garden, very tiny, is restorative and enjoyable and, and restive. And that's my own wellness garden. So it's not a matter of looking in the phone book and saying, where's the, late, where's the nearest wellness or healing garden? We can achieve that at home. So, so do keep that in mind. But I think you'll see some some fun things as we go through this. So I am going to go at a really good clip because I tend to wax poetic early on and then have to rush through the second half. So I'll, I'll go at a good clip to allow time for, for questions and, and we'll see some fun things as we, uh, as we go. Uh, recent photo, this is my older daughter and my grandson, Miles, uh, almost two years old. We need to do more of this. I mean, this goes without saying. This is at Cantini Gardens in, in Wheaton, Illinois in their children's garden. And he was just running around. He was more entranced by the gravel paths than just about anything else. But uh, he, we're getting him gardening and uh, we need to get those kids outside. Harry is also at Cantini and, and uh, doing a little expo exploration on his own. That immersion in nature is absolutely vital. And I think we all know that. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but we have a generation coming up that's primarily indoors and there's a lot of gamers and a lot of folks. And I'm not being critical of what people choose to do with their lives, but the idea of getting outside seems to be foreign to a lot of these kids, which is a, a real shame. But, you know, what is a healing, healing or wellness garden? It's really ambiguous, to be honest. It, it can relate to a lot of different things, and it certainly is um, dependent, dependent upon the intention of the space. You're seeing an image of a portion of a healing garden at the Legacy Health System, which is in, um, I'm going to say Portland, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's not limited to a clinical setting. When we hear about healing gardens, we start to think, you know, at hospitals, uh, they're used, uh, in, they're at prisons, they're at um, assisted care facilities, they're retirement communities. The idea that gardens offer something for us, not just an activity, but enjoyment, immersion, and again, the benefits we'll talk about very shortly. It's, a, again, very ambiguous term. So the healing garden where I manage at Edgerton is, has some specific features for accessibility, Etc. that we'll discuss. But again, all of our gardens can have that healing component. Uh, this is a, a mother and daughter combination at that same wellness garden you saw at Rotary Gardens in the first image. And what was awesome about my interaction with them was um, the, uh, the older lady was going along and reminiscing about um, her garden and was connecting with a lot of the plants, many of which were tactile in nature or fragrant along those low walls for the intention of engagement. So bringing the garden up in a situation where this visitor likely couldn't get down or up to, to enjoy it. So of course we wanna have restorative spaces um, and engaging with horticulture as we age. We just had a um, horticultural therapy symposium at Edgerton Hospital that talked a lot about adaptive tools and, and engaging in gardening as we get older, not just giving up on it. You know. A, my knees and back and hips are really starting to ache now. And, and uh, you know, I still want to put in a couple more years of gardening for sure. Gardens may have secondary goals like um, training or rehabilitation therapy beyond, again, that, that immersiveness. This is part of the Edgerton garden on the left here. But there's, in a nutshell, all this verbiage essentially says over the years, particularly the last 50 years, there's statistical evidence that gardens reduce stress and improve our lives, whether it's our home garden, but in clinical situations where they have measurables, you know, how long does it take for someone to recover, uh, the amount of medicine they're taking. They found that folks that had a view of nature or a garden uh, healed quicker, better, had more satisfaction than those that looked out on a parking lot or a brick wall, which, you know, it kind of makes sense to us, but these studies uh, st prove the statistical uh, variance in that, that obviously to us, a view of these zinnias is a lot better than looking out in a parking lot. So these spaces strive to support the health of patients. And I'm thankful I have a CEO at Edgerton, uh, the, the administration very supportive of the resources poured into this garden, not just financial, but the time in having a space that's not just a, a, a pretty landscape, it's meant to be utilized by 
staff, visitors, and uh, the community at large. So the benefits can be sensory in nature. That's um, galardia or blanket flower up top with uh, perennial flax. Um, but all of these points have been proven. There's less stress, less depression, a shorter length of stay, more satisfaction. In fact, at Edgerton, the, the outgoing surveys, the two primary components are, well, they love the staff, of course, but good food, which is maybe a rarity for at hospitals, but the healing garden. And the healing garden is meant to be immersive. For some folks get out into it, but it was designed to be seen from the majority of the windows. So the passive enjoyment, folks recovering, looking out on something, have mentioned that in their, um, their evaluations at the end. Less staff stress, the number of staff I see out in the gardens, not the last two days, I'll tell you, but um, the staff out recharging in a space that allows them to get out of the hustle and bustle of it and uh, essentially reiterating what I just mentioned, but I found it interesting, the little disclaimer at the bottom essentially says, due to our litigious society is essentially saying, hey, we're not telling you what you should be doing with plants um, in terms of healing or, or benefiting yourself. Um, talk to a healthcare professional. And we, we're always careful with that. And when we talk about sensory engagement, the Healing Garden at Edgerton doesn't do a lot with edibles with the exception of growing for our, our cafe, fresh vegetables and herbs. This has worked its way around the internet. This photo is not mine. Uh, but I thought this was interesting. This is a soldier in Afghanistan and uh, the soldiers had taken turns manicuring the little piece of America here. And we can argue that our 60 million acres of turf is overkill uh, domestically and all the inputs, but the connection to home, you know, fresh mown grass, in this case, fresh scissored grass, but imagine um, the satisfaction and the connection with home in this arid climate where you're seeing a plant, you're seeing some representation of of horticulture or garden back home. I alluded to the legacy health system. We saw an earlier image and I, I love this garden. They're um, top notch in terms of what they're doing with horticultural therapy. And I should mention, I'm not a therapist, a healthcare professional, registered horticultural therapist, I'm a, I'm a gardener. Uh, but what, what I can appreciate about this space is sensory engagement, not only with plants, but you see a water feature, you see some nice all accessible paths, areas of both natural and artificial shade, little breakout areas for folks to gather, a wall for enclosure, and that's for safety of patients and, and excluding, um, I will say in, in memory care facilities, a wall or a barrier is extremely important so patients uh, feel secure and don't, and don't wander off. But in this case, there's a lot going on. And if you look in the mid uh, distance, mid upper portion of the image, you see a circle of turf. That's a slightly mounted area that's used for yoga, tai chi, uh, therapy, and so a little bit of a space for that. But I imagine this is a very popular space for, for staff and visitors alike. And here's that same garden with um, professionals, healthcare professionals meeting or taking a break. Briefly with Rotary Gardens, I left Rotary Gardens in 2019 and a wonderful garden to visit in Janesville, Wisconsin with a long history. That healing garden, that wellness garden I mentioned is that colorful circle in the, the mid right of the image. Uh, old sand and gravel pit, 20 acres, um, and initially a rotary project, uh, a, an amazing uh, garden to visit if you're in the area. And as our drone zooms in, you see a pretty simplistic garden. It was, uh, this plan actually has another four phases if it, if it is installed beyond what you see here. We did phase one, which is the first circle raised beds of, of two different heights, and hopefully they'll continue. But I do wanna mention what you're seeing here as it was being constructed, two different uh, bed heights for wheelchair accessibility or a sitting wall in that lower section. Again, bringing the garden up. And uh, in the upper level, belly button height gardening, when you think about the idea of getting down on our knees and weeding and planting, it does get harder. And what was interesting is this garden was being developed. It was developed with the thought of accommodating a, a wide range of visitors, but a demographic that wasn't currently served. And that was visitors with severe mobility impairments, um, other issues that precluded them from getting around the garden or accessing it in a good way. So we're able to get people into this wellness garden immediately for activities. But my volunteers at the time, uh, many of the older ones with hip and knee issues were chomping at the bit to get to those raised beds, the taller ones to, to garden at waist height. 
And by the way, as a dimensional mention here, the width of those beds is only four feet because you're gardening from both sides. That's why the sidewalk's on both sides. So that's a lot of pavement, but it accommodates wheelchairs and again, access through the space. Did concrete for minimal glare, some brickwork to, to separate some of the areas. I think we had measured out the, the pathway for walkers to do a certain number of circuits for a mile. Um, what was awesome was in 2018, the garden, we had, uh, when the garden was completed, not planted, but the garden was built, we had three months until the dedication. So we had um, school kids come and uh, plant. These are seventh graders. And I laid out the plants and it was an amazing group. Here are the smaller ones with littler feet that got in and planted all the gaps. And uh, it's taking advantage of those low walls there for planting the raised beds. And uh, this is one of um, our user group. This is a, a group called um, Green Side Up and it's developmentally challenged uh, older teens and young adults. And here they are planting the garden as well. And this is a primary intent of those raised beds was accessibility. And then one week later, bam. <laughs> the intent was instant color, but wide range of textures, huge amount of fragrance. Um, but it was, uh, oh, I'm seeing, a, I get a little message that my internet connection is unstable. So I hope that doesn't persist. We're gonna keep rolling with it. And there's that space. We included fun things like Amaranth fat spike, very soft and velvety, and not in the back of a border at four feet tall, but in the front where people on the path could rub that. Everyone would have to touch that. Lots of fun. Or peekaboo plant or toothache plant. What's interesting, it's a side note, if you chew the leaves, your mouth goes numb. It was used, it's used by Aborigines in Australia to numb uh, the mouth for, for toothaches, hence toothache plant. But those little eyeballs are real interesting to, to touch. That's a seasonal plant. Uh, and chocolate cosmos. And if you, and it's, it's a very small bloom, but if you get real close, it smells like dark chocolate. We have this in bloom at the Edgerton Healing Garden and quite a bit of it. And it's fun to engage visitors to say, do you want to smell something that smells like chocolate or vanilla or pine, lemon? Sensory engagement, we'll talk a little bit more about, but fragrance is, is paramount. And it, that's a subjective thing. We don't all like the smell of lilacs in spring, most of us do, but keep in mind that many of our summer fragrances can be quite exotic with the tropicals that will thrive in our climate. And incidentally, this cosmos has tuberous roots that you can store like a, like a canna or dahlia, so you can perpetuate these. Walking labyrinths have a, a long history, and you maybe have run across these um, at other gardens, or sometimes they're incorporated into the flooring of hospitals. And in essence, it promotes right and left brain, brain thinking. It's not a maze. You're following a pattern where inevitably you end in the center and then you work your way back. And this is a, a larger one. Uh, I'll show you some other examples. This is the one at Rotary Garden that was installed. So you're following the tan path and a wheelchair can actually um, hug, or set, uh, hug the center line of these and work into the center. Now, I've walked labyrinths. Do I feel rejuvenated or better after I do it? Not, not necessarily. They're kind of, they're kind of fun, uh, but I've seen many, many of them in, in garden settings. This is over in Michigan. This is one that has a, a, a larger pattern. You can see these folks walking into the center. Labyrinths uh, have been mown out of grass. They've been created out of stones. This is a walking spiral. This is the Edgerton Healing Garden. So not so much a labyrinth as much as a, the same journey to the center and then, then back out with a white and blue theme. But it's meant for a contemplative sort of zen-like relaxation, but again, uh, not meant to be challenging or stressful, just relaxing. If you're ever in Madison, Wisconsin, and most of you get there at some point in time, go to the SSM Health, St. Mary's. They've got an amazing healing garden. I'm looking down from the fourth story into their labyrinth which is enormous and it's, and it's segregated. The path is gravel, but what you're seeing is uh, our grasses, that's prairie drop seed. Uh, this is not wheelchair accessible, which is a real bummer, um, but walking through there, if you know prairie drop seed, this is a, an image in late summer, it smells kind of like buttered popcorn, has a real interesting smell as you go through and brush this. Um, but again, the same purpose, but their entire healing garden is amazing. They also have a rooftop garden. This is third floor. 
and you're looking down. Of course, you're not seeing it from ground level, but when you're up in the upper stories, and I'm not sure how much soil is there, but it's a shallow soil profile, but you see some raised beds, some sitting areas. This is also a late season shot. I would, I would love to see all, all roofs in general have this, particularly not only for the view down, but the benefits of what these plants are doing for the environment, mitigating rainwater, all the things these plants are helping with as opposed to rainfall hitting the roof and being funneled off somewhere else, inevitably into our, our um, sewer system. But very engaging space, very textural. And a walking labyrinth at St. Mary's in Painesville. And if you don't know Hepticodium, it's a great woody plant, small tree, that's what you see with the pink. Hepticodiums will bloom white with fragrant flowers in September, and then the calices, the structures that hold the petals, turn this brilliant pink. So what you're seeing is post-flowering, but still extended color. This is a shot in late October before hard, hard frost. There's 13 of these around this massive labyrinth, which is gorgeous. And there's more of those hepticodiums. I digress in talking about plants, but again, do you need to um, uh, remove turf to install your own walking labyrinth? Not necessarily, but if you ever run into one of these, uh, give it a whirl. And here's a little bit of that same in SSM in Janesville, late in the season with lots of color and interest. You know, I feel that when you talk about uh, beauty, that's the icing on the cake with any garden. And we, we try different plant combinations. Some work, some don't. Um, we're always learning. But in a healing garden setting, of course, we want color throughout a large portion of the season. Here you're seeing uh, late September, early October with some asters blooming and grasses coming into the forefront. Um, but progression of bloom is one thing, but additional structure and texture in any garden is, is essential, not just as a framework, but uh, for that additional interest. And there's that same garden. Well, briefly, um, I won't make this an uh, infomercial on where I'm currently employed, but when Edgerton Hospital, the new rendition, incidentally, they're celebrating their 100th anniversary. This is their fourth hospital over 100 years, built in 2012. I actually did the initial, 2011, excuse me. I did the initial design for the garden, which would appear behind the hospital down in the lower portion of the slide around that pond, which is a retention basin. All the roofs drain water into that. By the way, where you see the helipad, the red, that entire field out front, um, at the time, it was the only or the largest geothermal hospital in uh, geothermal um, supported hospital in uh, Wisconsin. There's like 300 wells dug. I don't know how far deep, you know, for geothermal. I don't understand how all that works, but uh, it was quite cutting edge at the time. But the intention was always to have a healing garden on the south side. Um, and so I did some of the early design work that includes raised beds, lots of color, texture, little, little critical of this bed simply because the bench blocks some of the access, but it is actively used by our therapists uh, based on desirable clinical outcomes for the patients. I work with the therapists when they'll say, well, we have a scenario where we need to do a repetitive hand motion or a stooping thing or, you know, so we create, uh, it's, we have no shortage of tasks, but we customize the activities for the patient. Lots of fun with the raised beds. Yoga pad, this is a cushy little pad for yoga and Tai Chi, which is fun. Uh, auditory component, we'll talk about uh, sound in the garden a little bit later, but a beautiful uh, double waterfall. There's that retention pond, which was a mud pit when I did the initial design and is now quite gorgeous, except for the intrusion of cattails, which we continue to battle. The hospital actually owns a woodland you see in the distance and we've incorporated a half mile of walking trails through there as well for rehab or just enjoyment. This is open to the community dawn till dusk um, during the growing season and many, many volunteers. Can't say enough about the people that help. And there's a, a more current image looking, looking to the north on the backside of the hospital. You see that sort of V, the way the hospital funnels in? That was intentional to offer the recovery rooms and the therapy department views of the garden for, again, that restorative um, approach. So all along the history of this hospital, which is only 12 years old now, the, the administration has been on board with uh, supporting the healing garden. Although I will say 90% of our funding is independent of the hospital, which is quite amazing. Donations and all sorts of good stuff. But we'll travel to New Jersey where you're in a healing garden that is totally surrounded by four stories. So the ingress 
for bringing all these plants and materials was literally through the hospital. They would do it at night and off hours to bring in soil and et cetera, et cetera. And the water feature you see here, that little um, green circle at the base of it uh, is lit at night, illuminated. So you have this trickling water feature. There's little nooks and crannies, um, accessible paths, kind of a fun garden that again has four sides, four stories on each side of rooms looking down on it. Uh, so it's both passive and actively immersive. And so you have to enter the building, of course, to do it. So uh, kind of a fun space. I was able to, um, I went to a bunch of conferences where I uh, visited healing gardens and it's always been of interest to me. And this was prior to designing the one at Rotary Gardens. I wanted to know the ins and outs of what was appropriate. This is not the same garden and I won't remember the name of it, but uh, it's an Asian style garden. It's a, it's a primarily a cancer center, I believe, but meandering paths, lots of interesting shrubberies. Uh, and if you look closely, a, a nice water feature, Japanese maples. Uh, this is also out east, but inherently with gardens like this, as with our own gardens, there's maintenance costs, there's the time involved. So the real question in installing a garden in general is Do you have the time and funds to get all it doesn't and little just for privacy there's little nooks nooks and crannies that allow for um doctors to meet with patients and such and this was interesting it's hard to tell there's that same gentleman by the way on the phone so this bench this window is only 12 inches off the ground so people can actually sit on this lower portion or be in a wheelchair and be able to look out upon this Jap beautiful japanese maple and see hints of the garden in the distance I thought that was a nice touch. When we consider our gardens, a lot of times we're thinking about what we're seeing when we're out there. We're not as much thinking about what we're seeing from within our homes or our structures and looking out and developing views based on what we're seeing from within the structures. Not my image, but you see a walking labyrinth uh, from the top of the Seidman Cancer Center, Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. It's hard to tell, but it's a walled garden. So this is a very active intersection. So it's providing privacy and security to a space that um, families and, and patients can safely meander in and, and enjoy. Um, I don't know how often the labyrinth is utilized, but um, I did a lot of research on this garden in particular. I did not visit it in person, but thought it was nicely laid out. And that centerpiece, the labyrinth, and this isn't unusual, uh, it takes up a lot of square footage, but that doubles as a, a setup for events. Imagine having chairs out there in a dedication ceremony or a retirement party or something. And this, the same thing was happening at Rotary Gardens where the healing garden uh, instantly be, became uh, another wedding garden, which has a, is a mixed bag, folks, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Raised beds, uh, this is Ohio State, and very simple. You know, on gravel here, different uh, raised beds. This is uh, considered a healing or a therapy garden, primarily with providing accessibility. And again, we could be talking, of, this is a, a, a subtopic and that's bringing the garden up so we can continue the garden. And, and there's inherent challenges with soil preparation, drainage, longevity of materials, dimensions. There's a lot of things to keep in mind beyond like a traditional container. So these raised beds aren't necessarily um, low maintenance, but when properly placed and utilized can really offer a lot of dynamic programmatic space and, and enjoyment. We're at the point now at home where the wife and I have talked about getting um, like large um, stock tanks, like large containers for our vegetables and uh, consolidating. And this is the sign for that same space. And to the point, accessible, and this is what its intention is. I do, this is a little tangent, but I do want to mention when I, um, I, I took a course at Chicago Botanic Garden about, uh, it was healthcare garden design. And uh, it was like a 10 day course, very, very extensive information. And something I never thought about was you think about shade and I'll warn you, the Edgerton Garden has a lot of sun. There are some shady little areas, but we desire shade, particularly on a day like today. Well, when, when sight is compromised or when there's an issue of, issue of vision impairment, shadows can sometimes appear as, as holes or can, as obstructions. So sometimes shadowy patterns like this can be daunting. 
So I don't think the answer is to not have them, but ultimately uh, you can see the second point here, larger areas of shade are more effective, you know, larger shade areas as, as opposed to the dappling, which can be distracting and, and problematic. At Rotary Gardens, we did a lot of programs with the, the School for the Blind and Visually Impaired in Janesville. And it was amazing to us what we learned about those visitors and their sensory engagement. And um, again, how we can accommodate experiences for folks that may have some challenges with vision. But again, shadowing can be a challenge for those folks. Variable audience, who's using the space? And of course, in our own home gardens, we are. These are two of my volunteers at Rotary Gardens. Both have since passed, but from their from their retirement in their 60s till almost, they both almost made it to 90. Uh, Dave and Mary Hunt, um, they were out in their garden space at Rotary Gardens at least three times a week. And uh, this was their fix, their gardening fix. They had downsized the home garden. They liked coming here to the garden, doing their thing and um, making their, their impact and then heading home and not having to deal with it at home. But the audience will vary on the healing garden, who's enjoying it. Back to the Edgerton garden, the lady on the right is one of our uh, certified occupational therapy assistants and with a patient who had had a stroke uh, recently. And this is an older photo, but Anne is holding on to her and helping her engage with one of the raised beds where she's learning some, some of her motor, getting some of the motor skills back. And so the audience in our healing garden is variable. It could be a situation like this or someone recovering from knee surgery where they're supposed to do um, a certain amount of laps. And we've actually measured out our paths for quarter mile, half mile, full mile, uh, as well as the trail system. So we can, can accommodate that. A uh, very touching, heartwarming story. If you look in the distance between the ladies, there's a pavilion, which is some of our, our only shade out there. We had a situation where a gentleman was, was given three days to live, um, hospice care at home. And in lieu of that, he said, I need to be in a garden. I need to be outside. So he checked into the hospital and for three days, he was wheeled out in his bed. The pads accommodate a bed all the way under the structure. So he's getting a nice breeze bird song, the waterfalls. We didn't run any power equipment for three days and he peacefully passed and in a setting that he chose. And there's another audience member that I think that's a healing garden is very appropriate. But is there an accessibility issue? Is it, you know, a situation like this? Here's some volunteers at Rotary Gardens with, with different, different abilities. Uh, we set up um, some planting exercises on the left there along the walls. And uh, Rotary Gardens was not all accessible. We were continuing to try to hone that in, but we did have areas where some of our volunteers, uh, such as this group, could help help out. And uh, they had a blast working those walls. Another group doing some potting. This is a group, this is that Green Side Up group. Uh, talking about variable audience, uh, what was great is some of these kids really got into horticulture and, uh, and I think have moved on to working at nurseries or landscaping or other duties where they really connected with the plants. When we thought talk about therapeutic horticulture, again, this definition is on your slide list if you're, if you're interested. You'll have to wait till next spring for the wisteria on the left. That's at the Chicago Botanic Garden if you wanna track it down. But do note with my point here that the gardening activities are based on rehabilitation goals. What are we doing out in the garden to achieve a certain end result? And that's where the healthcare professionals they can determine in most in, in those instances, what, what do we need for an outcome? This person has to become more flexible or we need to strengthen the wrists or get them walking. And then the horticultural therapists or the gardeners can help assist in and how does, how does a garden help with that? What do we have out there? So this gets back to a little more formal healing garden bedding, but I wanted to talk about Donna who's wearing the Rotary Botanical Gardens uh, shirt. Uh, blind since birth and just an amazing, amazing volunteer. And what Donna did for us for many years was maintain the beds that you see on the right. And uh, I think I've got another image. So those four beds, each with three levels, hosting, there's various herbs, there's hot peppers. She knew by touch and scent every one of those plants and she could check for watering needs. She could, um, she was in there cutting back on time. There's uh, some lemongrass in there, some oregano, all sorts of fun stuff. We moved these for a, a special event, but the, this was Donna's garden for many, many years. And uh, in many cases, we let her pick what, what she wanted to grow. There are some limitations to the soil volume in those containers, which dry out really quick. 
So, so there are pros and cons to that setting, but perfect again, situation for Donna as our, our gardener. More of our green side up folks. The produce incidentally was donated to area food banks, which was awesome. But when we talk about the gardening, the physical benefits, you know, um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel better, you know, you're grunting through gardening and all the back aches. And I usually feel better the next day. I mean, th those aches and pains come along with maintaining flexibility and muscles. And, you know, we need to keep on moving. So the physical benefits of gardening, I again, preach to the choir. We, we know, you know, stooping, bending, engaging our senses. This is incidentally, Dr. Robert Yar, the founder of Rotary Gardens, who passed about three years ago at 91 years old. Uh, amazing man, and well into his 80s, he was just a, a, a bull, a bull in a china shop. He was always well-intentioned, always great ideas. He just was always diving right in, and just an amazing guy. Um, Bill Halfman, uh, 90 years old in this image. The names don't mean anything to you, but what was great at Rotary Gardens was having a lot of re retirees that um, were new to gardening. They came on not just to keep busy or to contribute to a cause they believed in, but to learn as well. So there's Dell doing some planting and some of the other groups again. Back to the legacy health system. Here's a, a, a patient in the, in the chair here doing some watering. The woman on the right is Teresa Hazen, who's very well known for uh, horticultural therapy. She manages their program in the legacy health system. But you see some raised beds, you see a pathway that's um, cushioned. Again, in some cases, some of the gardening activities will certainly be dictated by the ability of the, um, the user. But adaptive gardenings, gardens, changing our gardens as we get older certainly makes sense. And I'll harken back to what I said earlier. There's an amazing amount of ergonomic uh, tools that are out there and adaptive tools, not just tools made for better comfort on our body, bodies, but adaptive additions you can include or attach to your existing tools. All I can say is we've been doing it all wrong folks with how we use rakes and trowels. And there's an amazing amount of research and some of you have probably been exposed to the Southeast Wisconsin Master Gardener Group has this, um, uh, their lifelong gardening committee has this massive ergonomic tool display. Uh, email me later if you want me to connect you with those folks. They, uh, it's amazing. But you know, the benefits of, of gardening, these cognitive benefits, there's Victoria sorting labels for us. And I won't go through all these for the sake of time, but I think it makes sense to us that actively involving, involved with gardening activities, these fall into place as we're learning new skills and techniques. techniques. And to the fourth point, understanding all of those things associated with growth and death and change. And I've been reading a real interesting book and I'm not gonna remember the title, but it talks about um, the, the benefits of uh, the gardens and prisons and how those folks can focus on just the subtle nuances of, of nature and growing things as opposed to the hullabaloo of everything else going on in life. In their current situation, it's a welcome distraction. And some of our green side up group planting literally thousands of, of plugs in the spring. Which they didn't, then planted outside and got to see the end results. Psychological benefits, I and mean, we all feel good uh, after we garden. There's very little stress with gardening. I know sometimes we're like, for instance, I need to water after I'm done <laughs> tonight. Um, but again, one of the things that we did at Rotary Gardens to the bottom point here is uh, creating a skill set for some folks that were interested in gardening and giving them the hands-on opportunity. It wasn't always about productivity. It was about learning and, and engagement. I'll be critical, Victoria, uh, we built a lot of different raised beds for her, and that's one that's too tall. When you look at Janice in the brown, belly button height, perfect for her for a no stoop gardening activity, but for a wheelchair based action, challenging for Victoria uh, to reach. So there's a, a modified for Victoria. Notice the depth is a little, uh, it's only about nine inches, which is perfect for those annuals, but wouldn't be um, appropriate for say tomatoes or, some of our deeper rooted vegetables are, are planting. So it'd all be seasonal plants. What you're looking at is really a, a, a container. So proper soil preparation, drainage, et cetera. But the intention here was giving Victoria space to garden. Notice in the back right, the uh, vertical wall planter, accessibility for just about everyone. 
plant slid it into the side of plastic sheeting and that entire contraption is full of soil, well-drained. Social benefits, Victoria and Jordan here, uh, the importance of gathering. And I, I, my current situation at the Edgerton Healing Garden, I have a group of volunteers that they've made new friends. We do activities together, little trips. And the same thing happened at Rotary Gardens. We, with 400 volunteers, most of whom were gardeners, uh, relationships were formed. Fam it was a family environment. And so uh, again, pulling people together, horticulture can bridge a lot of things. And that's why it's so important in its utilization in settings where there's a lot of stress or recoveries involved. Um, it goes without saying that ultimately the garden will make us better people. I'm waxing poetic on some of that. Uh, Glenda Miller, a great example. She uh, she came to me and said, "I if I kneel down, I'm never getting back up. So give give her stuff that she could could squat or not have to get down in the ground." And this is a great story. Uh, it, it, a little depressing to start with because this is an assisted care facility that lacked the funding to an ability to bring their residents to Rotary Gardens. So what we did is we brought the show on the road and here repotting Sansevieria or snake plant. These ladies enjoyed the experience. We all know we get those endorphins from playing in the soil, um, but they got their fix in repotting houseplants. And I hope that's a program that continues, but sometimes the garden has to be brought to people. Uh, dividing perennials. Uh, we worked with recap programs. So essentially prisoners in lieu of short jail sentences or larger fines, community service. What was amazing with these folks, you're not seeing everybody, uh, and the orange vests are about 40 of them, which can be a lot of volunteers to work with. Different motivation levels, gardening skills. We got them out in this space and I said, come back in about three months and see what you did and what they did with that. I mean, that's what it, that red theme at Rotary years ago was a result of those 40 people working together. So with plants, you know, we, we may pick plants for, of course, beauty, but they may have other sensory features. They may provide a tactile engagement, fragrance, so that may be related to some of our outcome um, achievements, what we're trying to do. Uh, we're doing, at, this is Edgerton on the right, we're doing a whole lot with fragrance uh, right now. But the sensory experience at Chicago Botanic Garden here, woolly sage. You don't grow this for the flower, which is white. This is a biennial, so second year you'll be lucky to get a white flower, but who, who cares? It's a giant, it's a giant lamb's ear on steroids. So who's not gonna touch that? By the way, too much overhead watering and that will, will rot, but I use this every year. Uh, and, but in this case, it's in a wheelchair accessible um, uh, planter, but everybody of every age that walks by that would inevitably touch that. And my younger daughter was into lamb's ear at a young age, the idea of you know, just even lamb's ear. So this is not a staged image, uh, image on the right, by the way, this is a young, <laughs> young lady and she's holding dill and her exclamation after uh, right before this or maybe right after was she called it the pickle plant she's like this smells like pickles you know her association with the dill was oh my gosh what's this pickle plant um, but this multi multi-sensory stimulation is emphasized in therapy so it's, it's about beauty yes but movement sound all these other things that are happening in the garden so I use Edgerton a lot in my talk tonight, but it's not just a, a garden setting of beauty, uh, but it has auditory components, it has tactile components, it has fragrance. So we know all gardens are sensory. We may wanna emphasize sight. We talked about shadowing, but the idea of, if there's a, a consideration of vision challenges, mobility through the garden, safety becomes important, delineating path widths and, and progress. Um, there's a lot of things that ultimately need to be taken into account, but as vision diminishes, those blues, maroons, uh, and, and deep greens start to recede in the distance. So if you were to visit the Edgerton Garden tomorrow, what you run into is super bright uh, orange bed, a really bright red. There's a yellow and blue. Um, what we're doing is saturated colors for, for brightness because those really pop for everyone. They become more, uh, more visible. That's not to say you shouldn't use blues in the garden because they're indispensable, but Keep in mind if the population, uh, or that may include ourselves, if vision's becoming an issue, start leaning into the saturated colors. Here's some zinnias, which we use, by the way, for fresh cut flowers, bouquets, and other, other things at the hospital. Every year we move this bed around, we do a thousand zinnia plants. Auditory elements, so sound in the garden, 
you know, it's a little goofy with uh, plants in general, the idea of hearing, but um, they can be plant materials rustling and that those are breeze induced. You know, it's not, you're never going to read a plant tag or a description that says, sounds great in the garden. You'll hear, you'll get little hints like the seed pods of a baptisia may rattle or northern sea oats, which is a grass. When those seed heads form, they rattle in the breeze. Um, it can be plant materials. If uh, I won't wax poetic, but if you stand under a grove of white pines with a breeze, it really is pretty cool. Uh, or a prairie with wind. But it could be water features, wind chimes, um, non-living elements. That's not to say those are all good because that's subjective. Your neighbor's wind chimes that drive you nuts uh, aren't adding to your enjoyment of the garden. So the fact that sound can be an auditory cue, and particularly when vision is a, an issue, we're getting to the point where some gardens, a sequence of sounds will delineate space. So when, when it's not, when space can't be seen um, as clearly, sound may help delineate a transition to a space. And that again may include water. Uh, sensory engagement, touch, many, many textures. Working with that school for the blind and visually impaired, it was amazing that degree of, of variability with texture. That's purple fountain grass there. It's pretty, pretty common, but this time of year, who wouldn't be rubbing their hands through that, you know? Uh, interactive water features can be important. Here's my younger daughter who's sitting about 20 feet away from me. She's 23 now, so this was a, a, a while ago, um, but not, not a stage shot. That penicetum, that fountain grass, just, she was very tactile. She touched, she had to touch everything. Fragrance in the garden, again, subjective. The image on the left is a variegated mock orange. And so if you know mock orange, there's nothing better than a mock orange in bloom for, for fragrance. I like the variegation because the plant is interesting from start to finish through the year, but scent is variable and inevitably it's overemphasized, dramatized in descriptions, you know, fragrant. Um, we had a smelly garden at Rotary Gardens for years and some of the things we tried had very little fragrance, if any. So it's important to know how is the fragrance delivered? Is it emitted like this mock orange? Is it wafting about in the air? Which depends on wind, humidity, there's a lot of other factors, time of day. Um, or is it tactilely induced, like rubbing that basil or that rosemary? And at the Healing Garden, we have about 40 varieties of scented geranium that we have signs on that say, you know, smell this, this scented geranium smells like pine or orange or apricot, strawberry. One called Old Spice literally smells like Old Spice deodorant. So the Smelly Garden at, at Rotary Gardens, it was a lot of fun. We had samples that people could, it was really scratch and sniff, you know, go ahead and smell these. Um, it's not hard to get rose and lemon, but finding, uh, some of you know, popcorn plant, popcorn cassia, smells like buttered popcorn, that chocolate cosmos, the vanilla scent of a white heliotrope, and I'm just throwing things at you, but fragrance in the garden, I think we appreciate it when it hits us, but not all do we often think like, I need to include more. And I need to include more where I sit or out on the porch or in that window box. So proximity to the person that will enjoy the scent is important. And these kids uh, had a scavenger hunt, a scented scavenger hunt, and flipped out when they could find plants that smelled like lemon and chocolate and, and again, popcorn. So we created Gardeners for Life with these kids. And there's that popcorn cassia which know your plant because it's, it's a legume, it's, it's tropical and you won't overwinter for us. It's also poisonous, so you're not, you're not gonna wanna nibble on it, but it's, it's quite amazing rubbing that, the top of that bud is like buttered popcorn. So taste in the garden, again, with liability issues, uh, at Rotary Gardens, we were never like, hey, have a cherry tomato, because you never know about allergies and, and such. So uh, I enjoy growing produce. And again, in Edgerton, we have a separate area where we grow fresh produce for our cafe, but consider uh, some of the points listed here. Taste, I, I don't mean to gloss over, but that's so subjective. You'd have to decide what you want in your garden and certainly lends itself to the idea of healing, a healing landscape with, with fresh food knowing where our plants come from. But examples, here's fragrant heliotrope. Uh, the reason I show this when we talk about taste in the garden in a clinical setting, um, know your plants because heliotrope is deadly poisonous for you, your cats, your horses, um, as much as that fragrance is amazing. By the way, not all blue heliotrope has scent, so no, research that, but there are plants you have to be wary about. So at the healing garden, we're careful about uh, where we position plants. And uh, again, if uh, ingestion is a concern. Somebody just grabbing and eating something, and that can happen in memory care situations. 
Uh, you don't want to have poisonous plants laying about. But that value of water, there's my two nephews and my, my little one uh, at the Koi Pond at Rotary Gardens. You know, the value of water, there's a, a different experience at Niagara Falls when this is bumping through your entire body to looking at a tranquil reflection pond. You know, it's a different level of engagement. This is a healing garden setting. And notice the, the safety fencing to keep people from uh, rolling into it. Uh, but that sound, you can imagine the sound of that. So uh, again, water features have their own inherent maintenance and care. You need to know that. Look at this, this um, the cheat flow. This is at a children's garden. The kid on the left has already jammed his head in there, which is, you know, is going to happen. There's no doubt about it. And by the way, water features like this, there's a whole realm of um, you know, treatment for the water. If, it, if it's going to be used for anything related to play, uh, it has to be treated water. And it, anyway, it, it goes on and on. You can't just start pumping generic water up there. Um, but cheat flow at Chicago Botanic Garden. People of all abilities can jam their hand in there. Beautiful sound. These little, these, imagine these little frogs. This is at White River Gardens, Indianapolis Zoo. And our little bubbler, our ever-flowing urn. So independent of our two waterfalls, we have this urn, which is, which is cool. Just a little bubbling sound. So Chicago Botanic Garden, when you visit, an amazing garden. Go into their Bueller Enabling Garden where you'll see raised beds like this. All sorts of great examples. This garden's been around for over 10 years now. I took this image two weeks ago when I was there. So saturated bright colors. Their horticultural therapy program has seen some reduction in staffing and, and scale, to be honest, but it still exists. And, um, and hort therapy continues to be important at the, at the garden. And this is one of their all transitions, one of the raised beds. The blue asters were inserted uh, for, for extended color, as were the pansies. But that color, that laid out in any garden is gorgeous. But again, all accessibility. And, and what's interesting, Gene Rothard, who's on the right, a long association with Chicago Botanic, is showing a square foot garden for gardeners with vision uh, impairments. Their accessibility to this is they can trace that wire mesh and know the square footage. And, and in essence, it's different plants in each square foot. So again, I'm not saying build a, a brick wall raised bed and put this grid in, but specifically at this garden, this is used for a population of folks with some vision challenges where they can delineate different plants within this grid. And again, more of those water features. Hard to see, but these hanging baskets can be lowered. There's a little pulley system and a little crank, that whole brown thing to the right down the side of the pillar. So imagine a hanging basket now gets in the reach of someone in a wheelchair or someone with mobility impairments for not only planting, but bringing it down for primping, deadheading, watering, and then raising it back up. And that's the same system. I thought that was really cool. But here are some of the raised beds you saw earlier with that woolly sage uh, built for different height wheelchairs. The one on the far right is for a children's height wheelchair. That's not to say someone walking by wouldn't uh, enjoy this. My only criticism of the planters, certainly not the plants, but shallow depth, that's only, only six to seven inches. So you are a bit limited with what you can grow. And in, in this case, it's replanted every year in a shot from two weeks ago, the same system. Weeping Larch, I guarantee this was planted 10 years ago, right on the edge knowing everyone's gonna touch this. So here's a tactile engagement and a really neat kind of visual softening in the wall. So again, a weeping larynx or lark. Here's Gene showing one of the vertical planters. So similar to what I pointed out at Rotary Gardens in the distance, this is entirely filled with soil, sharp drainage. The plants are slitted into that, that framework of plastic and hardware cloth. And it's redone every year. It's refilled with soil and replanted. But some amazing things. So pretty much anyone from a three-year-old child to someone in a wheelchair to any visitor could engage with these plants. Really, they do some fun things. thought that was pretty cool. And in their edible garden, they transition a planter like this. And we don't, who has a 10-foot brick wall to do this? You know, this is parsley and, and pansies in spring, same planter in summer with trailing oregano and thyme. And uh, this was a spring uh, a couple years ago. Actually, no, this, sorry, this was fall. They did a late sowing of lettuces, cool season plant. So uh, greens, 
Accessibility, I'm checking time here. I'm gonna keep rolling at a good pace. Um, how do we get around the garden? This is one of the Hort Therapy Symposia at Rotary Gardens where we, we actually all took turns in wheelchairs and it was, it was eye-opening. Not just uh, maneuverability, like moving around, getting from here to there, but dealing with the subtlest of slopes. And what we found was some of the paths at Rotary really needed some help. We did an evaluation of, of slopes and, and trying to repair things, but accessibility through a space, notice the, the offset sitting area where the path width is not compromised. All too often I see paths poured in parks and such, six or eight foot wide path, and then they jam the bench on that path, which compromises some of the width. So having these little nooks and crannies makes sense. This is part of that legacy system again, where there's a little offset area. There's that turf yoga um, location on the left. A gravel path that's only one wheelchair width. That's a perspective from that same legacy um, health system. Look at the shade structure in the distance with uh, that's golden hops vine offering some privacy and shade. Looking at this, you know, I, I look at it and say, that looks pretty nice. I'd like to see that garden. And then I immediately start thinking of the maintenance, you know, so it's, it's not unreasonable to consider. It's important to consider what all this entails. Same garden, uh, all accessible ADA compliant slope with appropriate placed railings for additional support. And notice the little offsets here in the Teeling Garden. Over over in Davenport, Iowa, Vanderveer Park is super neat, but look at the uh, raised beds. If you remember the Bueller Enabling Garden, one of their staff told me one of the things they regretted was the fact that the raised beds had such angular or sharp corners because people were hitting those or hitting their knees on them or you know they were kind of jutting out. And in this case, you notice some very smooth rounded corners with about a 30 inch tall raised bed, which is appropriate for either sitting for some or certainly slight stooping, absolutely for adult wheelchair. Um, they're, they seem a little wide, uh, keeping in mind, I mentioned a four foot width, you need to be able to garden from both sides because uh, adult human has about a two foot wingspan in terms of reach. So I think this is about right, but um, they had an engaging water feature and uh, I know they bring groups in for this in, in playing this garden. And uh, uh, this is uh, Monona Terrace in Madison, a rooftop garden. You're not seeing all the things underneath here, which includes uh, part of the building and also parking. So a narrow so soil profile, but a raised bed out of necessity because they need soil to host these plants, but it becomes an accessible garden for most. But you're seeing some, and I'm sorry for the speed here, but you're seeing some example. 18 to 19 inches is a good sitting wall height. This is Joan who, uh, bad knee, she said, I'm not kneeling ever. So give me a spot where I can sit. Now you're rotating, you have to be able to pivot. And in this case, she's planting impatience within about two foot of the edge. And so I just kept placing plants along the gap, but that was a good, that's a good sitting height. Another example at Rotary Garden here. Again, for some gardeners, this is how they'll get it done. And there's Victoria working the same wall you saw earlier. So her reach was a little limited, but she could get right to the edge of that wall. This is at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum where they're using chimney flue sections as raised beds. So 24 inches is another good dimension for wheelchair accessibility. And the size of these allows for full reach and accessibility. They have a really neat, uh, the Landscape Arboretum is amazing. Uh, University of Minnesota has, still has a very strong work therapy program. And that's Mike Maddox. His name might ring a bell as the, um, he was the statewide master gardener coordinator for many years. I work with him at Rotary Gardens, but here in Madison at the Veterans Hospital, customizing an experience for a vet. And so in this case, getting a, a planter on top of this, this essentially this bench allowed this gentleman to actively garden and engage in the space. So here's customizing pretty much on the fly for the individual. At one of our local assisted care facilities, it's hard not to, you, you know, there, there's no gardening space beyond this. There's a series of these. And it's challenging, I think, for some of the folks to get around the turf sides. But this is right along the edge of the parking lot. But they were provided with some raised beds to grow vegetables and some other things. So I look at it and I think, man, I wish they had done more, had better accessibility. But there's also the comment that at least it's something. And they've recognized the importance of providing some amount of gardening space for the residents that can, can get out there. A little fancier with the brickwork here, but uh, same intention. If you look down the center line of those 
planters, there's installed irrigation. So the watering is less of an issue, but these are mini gardens that have all the same things we need to consider with soil and watering regime and, and uh, how these plants overwinter in an elevated situation. I mentioned uh, stock tank planters are becoming a big thing. Those are 300 gallon stock tanks. So two foot deep, uh, three foot wide, eight feet long, holes drilled in the bottom for drainage, of course, and uh, lantanas uh, taking it nice and hot here. But imagine a situation where there's, there's no traditional gardening space. You know, I've got all pavement, all right? You know, areas where you have a patio. This may be uh, your garden. And at Edgerton, I mentioned growing vegetables for the cafe. Here's a series of our 300 gallon stock tanks, same approach. This is in a hot spot where nothing else was growing anyway. So you're seeing cucumber on the right, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers. And we joke that it wasn't a farm to table situation, but it was a terrace to cafe, which is 40 feet behind, behind the camera here. So the chef could, he's very limber. He could hop right up there and get fresh tomatoes and cucumbers. and. Uh, we had cucumber tomato salad for like two months. It was, it was great. Notice accessibility on this race planter from the left, belly button height. From the right, um, there's a, a, a small bench and ultimately uh, more wheelchair accessibility. 30 to 32 inches is clearance. This is on your slide list. There's books on this too, so don't feel you have to... There, there is some debate about some of the dimensions, but it really is based on the user. Here's Victoria. You saw her earlier with this exact same bed, uh, which was perfect for her to access. And at Chicago Botanic Garden, we saw this cool desk with these inserts. So we, we actually uh, took photos and had our volunteer carpenters at Rotary Garden build it. And there's Victoria with her planter boxes and her desk. She could pick out whatever she wanted, and that was perfect for her. Gordon, getting down and up, very difficult, but he had this garden for almost five years at Rotary. We would exchange the soil every year, but belly button height was his, his gig and was accommodated. And we experimented with all sorts of raised beds, again, knowing that on a day like today, this was going to be watered twice. Uh, drainage became important. Uh, looking at this front container when it was wet was probably 1,500 pounds, so it wasn't two people grabbing it and moving it. It was a, a forklift, so yeah, you need to understand all that. Uh, what was fun at um, also at Edgerton is these rolling planters. It's a little hard to see, but these are six foot long, nice caster, so these can actually be rolled around the cafe patio, but the chef could come out and get fresh cilantro, basil, chard. Uh, he got to pick what he wanted for the kitchen. But again, bringing people to the garden, bringing the garden to the people. And what's interesting is Janice to the left, a co-worker at Rotary Gardens with the hat, that's her mother who had an extensive garden in her youth and is in a, a not assisted care, but uh, independent living where she was given this patio with no um, permission to do anything else. And so we built her this raised bed. So she, um, she got her fix and she had mobility challenges. So she wanted something belly button height, notice a little bar for her hanging basket. and. Um, Again, sometimes we do things like that. So briefly, we've talked about raised beds, containers can be its own topic, but I've alluded to these topics already, um, these subtopics that's not only proper selection of the container for, for dimensions, but consider how they'll be used by a user group. And sometimes we're just getting containers to put stuff in, but um, it's important to understand the nuances of that drainage, soil prep, and proper care. Those are mini gardens and we want them to succeed. I've alluded to tools. Notice the green, those are ergonomic curved handle tools. And in brief, you know, trowels as we're jamming them in the groundwork, it's a lot of wrist stress. And the fact that we're actually, um, we're modifying our grip is dispersing the physics along uh, the forearm as opposed to right on the wrist. And again, I'm not, a, I'm not a therapist in any way, shape or form, but back to my comment about ergonomic tools, I'm running into tools where I'm saying, well, I wish I'd known this 20 years ago. So they exist. So check them out. Easy grip. They look a little weird, but gripping something at a 90 degree angle is a lot better than that, that twist on our, our wrist. There's some of that tool display. Southeast Wisconsin Master Gardeners Lifelong Gardening Committee. And they the show goes on the road. They carry, they take these tools. By the way, they have a free publication that's many pages long. Uh, that you can download that talks about not just the tools, but proper 
uh, how we align our bodies, how we do things. They've done an amazing amount of work. This is the healing garden as we finish and we'll jump into questions and I'll let our host carry on with our, our time frame here. But this is a, a view looking to the Southeast, excuse me, Southwest. There's our three acre healing garden. Uh, we do hope you'll visit. There's a lot of fun things happening. It's not too late in the season to see what we're doing and get some ideas. But to my earliest comment, a lot of what we've talked about can be extrapolated into our own gardens, whether it's that sensory engagement, more accessibility, being easier on our body, creating healing spaces that really are we enjoy engaging in uh, as we get older. 